It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the former M- NBA player, Eric Strickland. How are you doing today? Good, Brandon. How are you today? I'm doing good. Can you talk good. about how you knew that you wanted to play professional basketball? Um, I mean, I think I knew at a pretty early age. Um, I'd always had a – my mom used to – my dad bought me the – little nerf with the you know dunk basketball i always had basketballs footballs um i i grew up i was born in alabama but my father was military so i moved around a lot my dad kept me pretty active in sports i was always very active and um you know for me the nba was just a dream it was it was something that i dreamt about um you know as a kid i mean i think when i say dream i don't mean dream about like playing in the NBA, but I literally had dreams that I was there. And so I was just pursuing what I saw, and that that pretty much led me to it. What was your college time like at Nebraska? Hmm. Had a great experience at Nebraska. I mean, I my father was stationed there at Offutt Air Force Base. Um, so coming up as, you know, in, in in, in high school, I, I, I was uh, I ended up being the second leading scorer all time in Nebraska history, and uh, it took 50 points to even beat that in a state tournament final game. Um, and so to have success there, and then as I was there watching what Danny Knee was building down there in Nebraska, having a good bunch of board, you know, friends, guys that I played with in in the summers and, and in the off season that became friends that we all just kind of had an idea that we should just go there and make Nebraska Nebraska great. And so that's, that's partly why I decided to stay. So it was just a great experience. Uh, Campus was always on fire. You know, the football team was, was doing pretty well. The whole campus was doing well. Volleyball was solid. So for me, it was a great experience to be there at Nebraska, especially as I was growing up and going through junior, junior high and high school and, and getting an opportunity to participate. What was it like putting on that red Nebraska jersey? And what were some of your accomplishments? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, you know, especially back then in in, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, to to go to Nebraska and to be a part of of such a a tradition in history, um, it was um, it, it, it was a great experience of of, of just excitement so uh, it, it was like it was a part of you it was like family it was like um there there was nothing like it the experience of coming to games and watching the fans and the students they literally sometimes would camp out and, you know sit out you know the night before in order to get tickets and it was just a very raucous atmosphere it, it, the Devaney center was quite quite filled on, on a regular basis and and so um it, it was it was a great experience to do that. What was it like, obviously, signing with the Dallas Mavericks as a free agent? Uh, it was like an, it was a culmination of everything that I dreamed. Uh, I'd worked my tail off. You, you have a lot of people that doubt you and doubt your abilities. And then to have one scout look at you and say, hey, we – we want you to be a part of something that we're trying to do. We're trying to build something fresh and, and a tradition. And I was familiar with that, especially coming from Nebraska, going to a place that, that didn't really have a lot of tradition at the time and to, to help start and, and, and build something great. So, you know, I, I take accomplishment in the fact that I was part of the, the unit the year prior to them winning their first, you know, 50, well, not first, but uh, after being losing – organization for so long and then to turn around and become a 50 win team you know in such short order uh to to be a part of that building process was great play great play with 
some wonderful uh, Hall of Fame players like Dirk and Steve Nash and and uh, you know, and then also to play with Michael Finley and that, that group of guys and to play with legends like Derek Harper, who had tremendous experience. So yeah, it was great being signed there. You know, obviously I was there when the big three was still there. So, you know, with Jason Kidd and, and that crew and Jamal Mashburn and Jimmy Jackson still there. So I got a chance to, you know, uh, just watch and observe, you know, what it was like to be a professional. What was it like learning under Dirk and obviously Nash? Well, I think I was older than, I was older than them. So <laughs> I'd been around a little bit longer. So. Of course, I used to try to punk Dirk a little bit. You know, if he ever tried to post me up, he was he was thin, you know, back then. He wasn't as strong as he was later in his career. So, you know, I, I put him out on the three-point line and, you know, I talked crazy to him. But, and, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, at that time, at that point, you know, Steve Nash was my backup. I, I started. So, so you know, I, I you know, I, I don't look at it from that standpoint. I look at, you know, as, as great competitors and, you know, a great bunch of guys, and it was a lot of camaraderie. We 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 uh, had a lot of respect and and, and and love for one another as as a, as a team, and and so yeah, it was it was good. What's that feeling like of putting on your first NBA jersey for obviously representing the Dallas Mavericks? Brandon, I didn't hear that question. They kind of broke up a little bit. What was it like putting on your first it's NBA? Been- what was it like putting on your first NBA jersey and representing the Dallas Mavericks? I'm sorry, I up on you. I didn't hear nothing of that question. What was Can it like? What was it like wearing the Dallas Mavericks jersey and representing, obviously, your first NBA team? Well, um, <laughs> so I got to wear the original old with the hat. Mavericks uniform. It's not the one that you see today. They changed their logo and, and when Mark Cuban had full reign of the team. So, um, you know, I have the historical um, reminder of that, but it, it was um, it was good to represent the city of Dallas. The people were great. The, the fans were phenomenal. Uh, they showed up and, and, and when they say uh, MFFL, they mean that, you know, Mass fans for life, they, they, you know, they really mean that. They're, they're definitely true and uh, they support, they come out. They're, they're, they're no different than from the Cowboy fans. They're very supportive of the city of Dallas. What was it like signing with the New York Knicks? Well, the history. You know, the history. I mean, you think about the Mecca of basketball, uh, you think about the Garden, you think about all those things. You know, the team was coming off of winning a, a champ, well, not winning, but going to the finals. So to play with the likes of Allen Houston and Sprewell and Camby and Larry Johnson, great bunch of guys. Um, you know, Charlie Ward was there also. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, you know, to be able to play in New York and represent the Knicks, and you, you, you can tell uh, that they have a, you know, a strong saver and love for the Knicks uh, there in the, in the Northeast and, the, and actually pretty pretty nationwide. I mean, Knicks fans were pretty much everywhere. So it was, it was great. It was, a good, it, was, it was good at that point, too. What was it like playing in Madison Square Garden and obviously putting on the Knicks uniform? Well, Madison Square Garden is nothing like it. Uh, I, I think it's some of the most – they they love you or they hate you. <laughs> so, um, you know – I didn't get to experience that part of it, but I wasn't there too long. I was only there a part of the season before getting traded. But uh, uh, yeah, they they were a solid bunch of guys, and you know, organization at the time was kind of yeah, it was very corporate driven, and so it, it's different from that aspect. But you had everything you needed. You you know you didn't you didn't want for nothing or need for nothing. You know everything you needed was there. So. You got a chance to play in some with some of the greatest fans that are in the NBA circuit. What was it like going to Vancouver to play with the Grizzlies? That's probably the only organization that I don't really, um, you know, claim. I don't even think I kept my jersey. I think I gave them away. <laughs> it, the, at that time, I, I can't say now, but at that, at that time, I think it was the 
you know, I think everybody hated to go to Vancouver. I mean, the city is phenomenal. Great, great, great city. Uh, the people were, were great. Um, but I think at that time, the organization just, it, it, it wasn't very good. And you just, you, you felt like you were second class, second rate. Um, so it definitely wasn't like any of the other, other organizations that I played for. What was it like going to, obviously, the Boston Celtics and putting on that jersey and playing there? Well, that was phenomenal, yeah. Uh, getting a chance to, as you can see, I got my cigars. Getting a chance to meet Red Arback and, and, you know, Tommy Heinz and, and some of the guys that were legends, uh, Jojo White, uh, Bill Russell, those guys were there on a regular basis. So, um, now, you talk about a raucous crowd. I think it was so... It was so poignant that they, you know, they, they ended up with the season that we had there, which we ended up going to the conference finals. Those um, those fans, we ended up calling the place the jungle because that's, you know, that's what it felt like. It was it was very rowdy uh, playing there. And you always know you was there when, when, when you smell the cigar walking into the locker room and you see Red Arback, you're like, well, Red's here today. So uh, uh, RIP Red Arback. Of course, what was it like going from the Celtics to the Indiana Pacers? Good history, uh, good tradition. Um, it was a good mixture of, of, of veterans, uh, getting a chance to play with Reggie Miller. Um, then you had some great young talent in like uh, Al Harrington and Jermaine O'Neal and, and, and uh, some guys like that, Jamal Tinsley. So uh, it was good to be a complimentary player to a a, success, a successful playoff team and having a successful uh, season with them uh, the one year that I ended up staying. It was pretty good. What was it like, obviously, coming from the Pacers, what was it like going to the Milwaukee Bucks? Uh, initially, I don't think I really wanted to go because I hate the cold, and I always knew what Chicago Colts were, you know, winners were like. And... And I got a chance to experience it. You know, whenever you come back from a, a game and you're on the road and you arrive and, and that winter wind coming off that lake and it's, whew, I mean, they literally had to keep our cars in a hangar because it, it just was so cold. So, you know, they bring them out and heat them up and make sure that we're good. But the organization was good. Uh, you know, guys, young guys that were up and coming, uh, a dunk champion, I think, in Desmond Mason, um, Michael Red, uh, TJ Ford before he got injured was there, and so it was good getting a chance to play with uh, you know NBA three-time champion Tony Kukoc. Um, I think he won three, he might have won more, but I think it was I think it was three. Uh, and and good veterans like that was was good. Uh, made some good runs, just. Uh, we didn't have enough power to, to push us over the hump, but, you know, we had a solid team. What were some of your accomplishments with the Bucs? Uh, I was very just complimentary. I, I, I think my accomplishment there was being named the captain of the team, which, you know, I, I would have never thought, but, you know, to know that the, the players had respect for me and, um, that they, they thought enough of me as a leader to, to name me a captain. Uh, so I think just whenever I was needed, whenever they called upon me, I just had to stay ready and went in and did my job, whatever that was or whatever it called for. So uh, just being a, a, a solid supporter of the young fellas and talking and helping them to endure some of the hardships and ups and downs and what the league has to, to offer. What was it like, obviously, putting on the Bucks uniform? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I guess I could say very good now, <laughs> being that they won a championship this last year. So, um, I think I think the way you look at it, Brandon, it's just always an honor to represent wherever somebody wants you, and they want you to be a part of their organization. I, that's just the way I felt. I felt like it was just always an honor to to wear the uniform. Period. You know, no matter where I was at, to include even Grant, uh, Vancouver. I mean, just wearing a uniform and being a part of the fraternity was, was a phenomenal honor.
course, looking at this previous year with the Bucks winning, how how is it like knowing that obviously you were a part of that franchise before they won and now seeing them win now? What is that like for you? Because uh, because I got a chance to see that they did it the way that we were trying to do it. So that means they stayed true to form, that um, it, it wasn't about any specific one individual or person. It was about the organization and and all of those guys you can see that was there, you know, although you have Giannis, Giannis there um, and, you know, some of the other, you know, other pillars of the organization, their support guys were just as valuable to the organization as their, their leaders were. And, and I think that's why Giannis stayed and, and he saw that. And, and it's, it's good to see them uh, have that, that honor of winning their, uh, a world championship in the way that they did it. What is it like, obviously, to see Giannis come out with, obviously, the world championship and an NBA ring? I mean, kudos to him because he didn't, he didn't have to go chase it. He, he brought it to where he was at, where he was drafted to, in the same manner that Dirk did. So, yeah, it's an honor. What was the feeling like whenever you put on all of your jerseys and had your last name on the back of them? Um, <laughs> it's like it's just like a dream come true you know you, you, you got to see the fulfillment of your dream you're not only representing the organization you're representing the family name that you have so when you look at it from that perspective of having your jersey and your name on it is, um, is a tribute to the work and the time that you put in as an athlete what are some of your favorite memories and moments in your NBA career? Well, getting the assignment of Michael Jordan, you know, as a young player in the league, um, you know, to start and, and to have that as an assignment, of course, you know, uh, to me is the greatest player of all time. Um, uh, getting a chance to play in the old form uh, before they went to the Staples Center uh, where Magic and, 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 you know, Showtime was, uh, uh, was invented. Um, you know, just getting a chance to compete against the best that the NBA had to offer. You know, the likes of John Stockton and Gary Payton and, you know, shoot, Tim Hardaway. And, um, you know, I can go down a list of just, you know, guys that were phenomenal players that you kind of looked up to, but getting a chance to compete. So that was good. What was it like getting to compete with players like Magic, Magic, Kobe, Michael Jordan? Um, I didn't get to compete against Magic, except in the off season, but, uh, but definitely Kobe, me and him came in the same year. So you know, those players are, are phenomenal talents and, and deserving of every honor that they have. So. I'm just a competitor, so for me to do that was, was uh, you know, just it, it just felt good. What is it like seeing players now like Stephen Curry, LeBron James, and even Giannis play in this generation of basketball? You know, the game has changed a little bit from when I was around. It's definitely more of an open flow, open, uh, you know, a lot of threes now. Uh, which we shot threes, but not to the tune that they do now. Uh, we had more big men than they probably had to to deal with, um, with you know the Ewings and the Shacks and the Sabonises and and you know uh, you know Elgalskises and Yao Mings. So there was a lot of really strong centers, uh, Akeem Olajuwon's, uh, Dikembe Mutombo's. So. It, it was a lot, uh, but seeing them now, you know, good. You know, I, I you know, definitely get the money that they're getting. I'm, 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 I'm excited for them and to, to be a part of that transcendence and to uh, what they do today. What were some of your game day routines and rituals like during your playing time? Well, I pretty much would kind of get there, listen to music, sit in my locker, um, go through my assignments we had our scouting reports uh, go through that um i had a certain time i got there pretty early maybe a few hours early so i could get shots with not a lot of people on the 
on the uh, on the floor, get back in, um, maybe take a shower, and eat on a little bit of pasta that they had in the uh, family room, and come back and just get ready, or get mentally focused, just close my eyes and visualize what I have to do. Of course, what are you doing now after retirement? Uh, so I've invested in a company called Cerebro Sports. Um, Cerebro Sports is a sports analytics company where we help universities, we help marketing organizations, we help scouts, um, we help the NBA to be able to find, acquire, and have detailed information in which to make decisions from uh, that, uh, especially from players in, in the uh, um, in the scholastic, in the, the prep uh, high school uh, realm in which there's not a lot of data on players these days. So we just kind of help them to be able to see numbers, to help them to be laser focused on particular archetypes of players and uh, to be able to find them and to also project uh, their arc of career and, and to make some assessments with analytics. So uh, that is what I do, and, and I, I work alongside of a buddy of mine. We do a little bit of, um, we build some projects, and we're working on, we build some wing stops right now. We're building some some houses, and we're building some uh, you know, a town hall project here in the Orlando area. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a project manager with him, uh, getting those done. Um, and then I have a radio show on 93.7, 93.7, the Ticket FM. And on Tuesday nights from six to eight, in which we 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 have a focus on uh, Husker athletics, but we talk all things sports. So we talk about you know, you know basketball, baseball, NBA, MLB, uh, NFL, uh, anything that's fresh and new in the sector. It's it's very sports related, uh, driven, it's not politically driven. It's very sports driven. So uh, that's what I do on Tuesdays as well. So I stay pretty busy, pretty active during the week, and, and I also do post game, uh, post game uh, 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 analysis uh, upon the games for the Husker basketball as well. What was the transition like from you from obviously putting down the basketball to getting into the corporate world and working outside of basketball? Um, it it it, was, it wasn't too difficult for me. I think some of the transitions on things that I've done you kind of have an apprehension but I'm a quick learner um I love new things new tasks new builds um business and stuff was always a, a, a thing for me so when the lights turned off and people ask me all the time do you miss it and I'm like no uh, I actually enjoy what I'm doing now um uh, I still like to travel I like to play golf um so for me it wasn't uh, a hard transition. I actually enjoy uh, all aspects of what I do now. What advice would you have college basketball players looking to play in the NBA? Just continue to hone your craft. You know, if there's weaknesses, be able to truly assess and identify what they are and, and to, to, to increase on those. So if, if ball handling is an issue, you know, come back the next year with that, be able to watch film, be able to to have a true assessment, not from other people, but of yourself so that you can make adjustments and, and scouting reports are very detailed in the NBA. So uh, being able to, to know what people think of you and how they view you and then be able to, um, you know, come back with something fresh every year because there's always someone new trying to come take your job. So you gotta, you just gotta, you gotta stay the course. It's not, it may not happen for you early, but you always gotta be ready. What advice would you give current and future NBA players that are playing now? Uh, just don't burn your bridges. You know, uh, I think everybody don't look down upon anybody. Everybody you meet is a potential to be a, a partner or, you know, to be somebody you got to do business with or against or, um, you know, you know, just knowing how to do, do well and right by your money and making sure that you, you have the means and the abilities to take care of and handle your family. And uh, so those are some things that I, I uh, What advice would you give professional athletes looking to transition from playing 
to obviously getting into the corporate world and putting down the basketball? Well, be a willing learner. Just be willing to learn. Be willing to humble yourself and know that you're not the smartest guy sometimes in the room. And being able to listen, that's what I would say. That's wonderful advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media? Uh, on my Twitter is eStrict20. Uh, Instagram is uh, eStrict20media. Um, and uh, those are pretty much the ones that I use. I'm, always, I'm not a big social media guy. I mean, I have it, but I know I've got to be better now that I have a radio show. And, uh, you understand more than, more than anybody. Um, but you gotta, you gotta stay present in the moment and, you know, touch your people, you know, time to time or more times than not. And, uh, so yeah, that's where I can be found. Thank you again, Eric Strickland for your interview and best of luck in your future as you begin your radio career. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it. You have a wonderful evening. Take care of yourself. Good luck to you. You too. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk, Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Eric Strickland, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.